there I am. So, hi. My name is Thorin Tabor. I'm a computer scientist and software engineer by training. But in the last few years, I've fallen into a world where I work with bioinformaticians and various data science tools applied to biology. I'm part of the Mezerov Lab, which is currently a collaboration between the University of California, San Diego, and the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Gene Pattern Notebook environment, which is a suite of Jupyter extensions and associated libraries that we have developed to make working with Jupyter easier when collaborating with non-programmers. Uh, we use these tools with cancer data, looking into the gene expression of different tumor samples. But the majority of the tools I'm going to talk about today are domain agnostic. That is, they should be equally applicable regardless of your field. So by way of introducing this, let me tell you the story of how I came to work with Jupiter. As I said, I'm a software engineer by training. And in the past, I've worked on a variety of open source projects, mostly geared towards reproducibility and accessibility in scientific research. So a few years ago, uh, Chet, who was my boss at the time, um, uh, comes up to me and says I should check out these IPython notebooks, which, as you know, are now called Jupyter. And I did, and they were pretty slick. In particular, I was impressed with the ability to annotate your work with a linear narrative and then to quickly iterate through the code calls as you develop them. And to give some context, at the time, we're working on the classic gene pattern, uh, which was already an open source platform for taking bioinformatic and data science tools, and then wrapping them so they could be executed from a user-friendly interface. Uh, but our platform at the time didn't have the same narrative structure that you would see in a Jupyter notebook. And that structure is really intuitive. It's not unlike the structure uh, you were to use if you were to, say, publish a paper. And, uh, see, in, and Jupyter integration seemed like the natural next step for us. So from there, we began to delve into Jupyter development. Chet began putting together a notebook for working with RNA-seq methods. And I began prototyping a way to integrate our suite of gene pattern tools and make them available in the Jupyter environment. Uh, we flew to Berkeley, met with the core Jupyter team, and there's been a lot of development from there. So at this point, I want to take a show of hands. Um, uh, who here uses Jupyter in some sort of data science? All right. Um, uh, who here does work on the framework itself, whether you know creating your own custom kernel or MB extension or something of that nature? All right. Uh, is who here works with uh, biologic data of some variety? All right. And is is there anyone here who's not a programmer at all? All right, so based on that show of hands, uh, this is a pretty programming savvy audience, uh, which is unsurprising given that this is JupyterCon and that Jupyter is at its core a tool for presenting and executing code. And if you're a programmer, you may be asking yourself, well, why does it matter if Jupyter can be used by non-programmers? And let me give you an example of why this does in fact matter. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I work in a bio lab. And there's a, a basic truth of pretty much any biology lab, and that is, there's going to be a wide disparity in the ability of individuals to code. And that's going to be true, I believe, in pretty much any technical field. Um, so while there may be a bioinformatician or data scientist in the lab who eats clustering algorithms for breakfast, there may be uh, three bench biologists who, while they're great at working with the underlying math or biological concepts, uh, lack prowess, so to speak, at the command line. Um, uh, Make, making Jupyter Notebooks friendly to non-programmers is good for mixed environments like this because it allows people of all levels of technical sophistication to uh, reproduce complex analyses. And it helps keep the programming inclined members of the environment from becoming bottlenecks for that sort of work. And at, and at its heart, this is one of the big appeals of Jupyter, a user-friendly interface in front of an interactive shell. So with this in mind, we have created the Gene Pattern Notebook environment. It consists of a suite of Jupyter extensions and associated libraries that extend the familiar Jupyter interface, making analyses accessible to both programming and non-programming users through user-friendly interactive widgets. These widgets can provide interface to programmatic functions or calls to external services, 
or they might present the results of analyses, displaying tables, interactive visualizations, or linking to external files. We also have a suite of Jupyter Hub extensions that help enable collaboration in, multi -user, in a multi-user environment by providing notebook annotation, publishing, and sharing capabilities. One of the underlying goals is to encapsulate a complete research narrative from its conception to its dissemination. This way a researcher can leverage the best of what Jupyter and Gene Pattern have to offer. Interleaving text, graphics, interactive widgets, visualizations, or other analytic aspects. Now, before I go too far into the details, however, I first want to take a look at a real-world example of these tools in action. So, what you see here is a screenshot of a fairly typical Jupyter notebook. What it's doing is loading gene expression data from various tumor samples and then performing support vector machine SVM analysis uh, to divide those samples into different classes. These classes should align the different tumor types. This is first performed in a set of training data where SVM attempts to find the optimal hyperplane for dividing the samples. It's then given a new set of samples of unknown tumor type, and the hope is that it'll be able to predict the, the type of these samples based on the hyperplane chosen with the training data. Now, if you didn't follow what I just said, that's fine. I'm not going to quiz you later. Um, uh, but I do want to note that SVM is pretty common in machine learning these days, and this particular notebook uses the implementation in the scikit-learn package. Anyway, uh, this example works, but is also about 70 lines of code. And if we're going to reuse this notebook, that code needs to be maintained. Furthermore, if I'm saving this notebook and sharing it with my less programming-inclined colleagues, it would be a challenge to explain to them how to modify it to use their own, their own data or to set different SVM options. Now, here's another notebook. It's also doing SVM analysis, only it's using one of Gene Pattern's interactive widgets. Analytically, these two notebooks are identical. That is, they're both performing SVM analysis on the same training data, using the same test data, and will reproducibly yield these same results. In this notebook, however, the SVM analysis is being rendered as an interactive widget. And if I shared this with my less programming-inclined colleagues, it's a lot easier to explain. Uh, just click the Upload button, select the data you want to use, and then click Run. Even as a programmer, I like to sometimes use these widgets. If nothing else, they help to reduce stupid, all but time-consuming mistakes that I might make in the code. All this makes for faster and more accessible research. I like to say it's the quicker picker-upper. And one more thing before we take the deep dive into the specifics. I want to remind you that everything you see here is open source. Everything we've done in the last few years has been released under the BSD3 clause license, although we still have a few older projects kicking around under other open source initiative approved licenses. So I keep mentioning that Gene Pattern Notebook environment is a suite of Jupyter Hub extensions and libraries. And here is the specific breakdown. Um, uh, NB Tools is our interactive widgets framework. Jupyter WYSIWYG is a rich text editor for markdown cells. Notebook Repository um, uh, contains Jupyter Hub notebook sharing and collaboration functionality. And finally, the titular Gene Pattern Notebook package includes our bioinformatic and machine learning offerings. And I'm going to go through each of these packages in more or less the order you see here. So to begin with, Let's take a deeper look at the NB Tools package and extension. This package allows a notebook developer to render Python functions as interactive widgets, both the input, the input to a function and the output produced by that function. It also allows users to string together these functions so that they form a complete interactive analytic pipeline. NB Tools is built on top of, IPy, of the IPy widgets library which is the core widgets library developed by the Jupyter team. It also includes a user interface where a non-programming user can add new analytic steps from a graphical menu. Now, in my opinion, out of all of the features I just named, the ability to render widgets as interactive functions, as, as interactive, render functions as interactive widgets is the real star of the show. And uh, we call this the UI builder. It quite literally allows you to take any arbitrary Python function and render the interface to that function as an interactive web form. Then a user can just fill out the form and click the Run button to execute your code. This means that if you're a programmer, 
you can write your own code, then with a single line, use NB tools to render a form-based interface to your method in a manner accessible to both programming and non-programming users. And I want to note that it is fairly smart about how it does all this. It will infer expected parameter types from default values. It will display description based off the function's doc string, and it will use parameter annotations to provide descriptive text. Additionally, uh, you can override any of these defaults with a bit of metadata, and the user filling out the form can use either string literals or reference variables by name. The UI builder even has the ability to upload and load files from disk by dragging and dropping the file into the input field. Now, you may be wondering what the code to produce that the widget I just saw on the last slide looks like. Well, it looks something like what you see on the screen right here. In this case, we have a small Python function that simply wraps scikit-learn's k-means clustering object and fits it to a set of data. Uh, we've imported mbtools, and to this function, we've added a single line of code, which is the decorator you see in italics uh, right there above the function. Um, to display this function in Jupyter cell, you simply need to leave the function as the cell's return value, or you can display it uh, using ipython.display, and the widget will be automatically rendered. In addition to turning Python functions into interactive widgets, nbtools also supports the ability to display output text, links to result files, or even visualizations. We bundle this functionality together in the UI output widget. These widgets help maintain a consistent feel and help call out the important parts of a cell's results. This signals the users where their attention needs to be focused. To create one of these widgets, just return the UI output object in Jupyter cell, passing it as a parameter any of the output values you want to display. Finally, MB Tools provides an easy user interface for adding new interactive widgets, analyses, or other content to your notebook document. This interface allows a user to browse or search through the available analyses and adds the appropriate cell with the click of a button. We call this interface the Notebook Tool Manager. It has its own rather simple API, and in fact, UI Builder widgets are automatically registered with this manager by default so that their analyses show up in the list. You can also use this API to build up libraries of your own analytic tools and have them loaded into the interface. In fact, right now, we're working with a number of other labs in integrating their Jupyter offerings into the manager. And I want to take a moment here to note that we use NB tools internally in all of our analytic gene pattern notebook offerings. So even if you aren't somebody working in the realm of bioinformatics, the tools I'm going to talk about later can still serve as useful implementation examples in how to use the MB tools framework. Um, and now I want to show you a live demo of uh, this package in action. So let me just switch over to Chrome here. Um, OK. So the notebook I'm going to demo live here is doing principal component analysis, PCA. Um, I've picked it because PCA sees widespread use in data science, and this particular notebook also demonstrates a number of features that we've implemented, uh, including calls to remote services, local code execution, and displaying visualizations. Plus, it's using a data set that runs quickly, which means I can demo it in the time I have for this talk. Um, I don't want to digress too much into how PCA works or the specifics of the data set, but uh, what we're working with here are breast cancer samples uh, and paired normal samples. And we're going to use principal component analysis to examine the phenotypic differences between the samples. It's going to pick out the principal components that uh, best explain the variance. And that's a bunch of data science talk that I, I, I don't really have time to explain. There are a bunch of books that could do it way better than I can. Uh, but we're going to examine the results in a couple of different visualizations. So uh, let me just get my mouse over here, and we can start looking at the screen. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to demonstrate uh, logging into remote service. Uh, this is a login cell. I have already done that, uh, the logged in, logging in, just because I didn't want to type my credentials up on the screen. Um, but what we're going to do is... Uh, this remote service lets us execute uh, our principal component analysis on this uh, high, capaci high capacity compute cluster. And I'm going to hit run. Uh, I've already filled out the form here. This is the data. 
And we've got a couple options for whether we're going to cluster by columns or row. And here is our results. You can see the status on this uh, queue. It's currently pending. And it should take uh, probably about 60 seconds to run here. And then eventually we're going to get some results uh, going to be returned to us in a set of files. Uh, and these files are going to be three. There's going to be the uh, S matrix, which contains the eigenvectors, the T matrix, which contains uh, the transformed version of the original data, and the U, U matrix, which contains the eigenvalues. And here you can see uh, the job in our queue has been completed. Uh, our widget has automatically pulled for the status in the queue and provided us with links to the, uh, the outputs. So this is all done in an external service. I want to take these and load these locally in the Jupyter so I can work with them in, a, say, you know, a, a NumPy array. And uh, this is just a set of code here um, that's doing exactly that. And all of this is all linked up where I can easily pre-populate this sort of like a dropdown. So I want to give it the S matrix and the U matrix. Uh, there's some text explaining all this up above, but I, we don't need to go into that. And I'm going to just hit Run. It's as easy as selecting a couple drop downs in the form. And uh, here are our result matrices. And then I'm going to load a file containing some class data, uh, which is basically what we're going to use in our next step when we show this, uh, this uh, visualization. And I've loaded that. And now let's look at, the, look at our results. Um, here they are. It may not quite fit my screen. Let me zoom out a couple times. But uh, here are the different samples. I can see them rendered right here in 3D and rotate around or whatever. Um, the blue samples are the tumor samples. And the, uh, the red samples are the paired normal samples. So that's our uh, PCA results right there. And if I want to look at the individual principal components it got, I can do right here. Uh, again, let me zoom out. In which case, we can see there's a singular principal component that explains almost all of the variance in this data set. Uh, and then some other ones down below that are dwarfed by the single component. And uh, as you can see, there was this, this here was a whole PCA pipeline uh, that was as simple as, uh, you know, dragging and dropping in our inputs and then pressing a few buttons. And that's a lot easier to explain, it's a lot easier to explain to a non-programmer how to use this than uh, pages and pages of code and then telling them which variables to change if they want to change their input. All right, so let me go back to my, uh, my LibreOffice presentation here. Um, all right, so moving on to the next package, and along a similar vein of making things more accessible, we have developed an extension that provides rich text, what you see is what you get, WYSIWYG style editing for Markdown cells. This means that if uh, you're working with someone who doesn't know Markdown, or if you just want to see a more graphic representation of the cell you're currently editing, you have that option available. It's presented with a familiar word processing style interface. And I'm excited to say that as an open source developer, this has been a milestone for me. Uh, it's been picked up by SUSE Linux and made available as part of their Linux distribution. Um, uh, through the YAST package manager, uh, which is kind of exciting. All right, and the next package I'm going to talk about is a bit different from the rest. Rather than being an extension for Jupyter itself, it's instead an extension for the Jupyter Hub multi-user server. We call this functionality the notebook repository. It's essentially a web service that runs alongside Jupyter Hub and integrates with Jupyter Hub's services API. This service provides notebook sharing and publishing capabilities to users of the Jupyter Hub instance. This is paired with a client-side extension that calls the service, allowing a user to browse the available public notebooks, uh, to retrieve a copy of one of those notebooks, or to share their own notebooks with others. This makes uh, Jupyter Hub easy to use in academic collaborations or in any sort of group environment. Um, uh, And that brings us back to the self-titled uh, Gene Pattern Notebook package. Now, I told you earlier that uh, near the end of the talk, I'd make a pitch for biology and bioinformatics related offerings, and this is it. So if you're not in that space, please bear with me for the next few minutes. Uh, but you still might be interested in some of the machine learning functionality that we provide. 
anyway, uh, what is Gene Pattern Notebook? The short answer is that it is the Jupyter gateway to the, gre to the greater Gene Pattern ecosystem. And um, uh, Gene Pattern is a, uh, itself a platform for reproducible bioinformatic research. It's a long established pro project that's uh, been a staple for a while. Uh, the first release was back in 2004 and it's been going strong ever since. That puts it on similar footing to IPython, the parent to Project Jupyter. Uh, Gene Pattern is open source under a BSD style license and our repositories currently have some 250-ish analytic modules wrapping some of the most popular methods in genetics, genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics, as well as general machine learning methods. It's got some 60,000 registered users, and the gene pattern public server usually runs somewhere in the ballpark of 4,000 analyses, analyses each week. And finally, I want to note that it's an open platform. There is a repository of community contributed methods that cover a wide range of bioinformatic techniques, including CRISPR analysis, uh, bisulfate sequencing, flow cytometry, and RNAi screens. Behind the scenes, these analytic modules can be either ran on a local command line or packaged in a Docker container. Um, this means that Gene Pattern can execute analytic tools regardless of whether they are written in Python, R, Julia, C, or even Perl if you're that perverse. Um, our wrapper provides a standard interface to the analyses so they can be called from a variety of programmatic environments. Behind the scenes, our Jupyter interface uses the Gene Pattern Python library, uh, but we also have client libraries written in R, Java, and MATLAB, as well as a web service that makes executing analytic modules possible through a RESTful API. For example, you can use these tools to run an analysis in Gene Pattern retrieve the results of the analysis, uh, and then use that data, data with popular Python libraries, such as scikit-learn, plotly, matplotlib, or pandas. This also means that you are not limited by the analyses available through Gene Pattern, using the provided analyses, and coding your own programmatic analyses can be integrated rather seamlessly. And in fact, we provide data tools in our Python library for many common bioinformatic file types. These will recognize the type of data being loaded and automatically import it, including row and column headers, into, pandas, into a pandas data frame. This is available both for files output by gene pattern analyses and for any other file the user possesses, so long as it is in a supported format. Uh, once the file has been imported into a data frame, it can be viewed, filtered, or used in conjunction with numerous other Python libraries, and even written back to the uh, file format from which it was originally imported. All right, so this all sounds good. Where do you go to use this functionality? If you just want to try it out and see how you like it, or if you work in the domain of biology, you can see our tools in action on the Gene Pattern Notebook repository. No installation required. Uh, this is a free and public Jupyter Hub instance that we host for biologic and bioinformatic research. It comes uh, with all of the Gene Pattern Notebook extensions, as well as many open source bioinformatic and machine learning libraries. And on it, we host a collection of public notebooks uh, demonstrating common methods such as single-cell RNA-seq clustering. It's available to the public at genepattern-notebook.org. Uh, if you want to install any of these extensions locally, uh, they've been made available through the PIP and Conda package managers. Uh, if you install the genepattern-notebook extension, you should get the entire suite. Uh, alternatively, uh, you might opt to only install MBTools or Jupyter WYSIWYG or any of those other packages if you want only that particular package. We also have a Docker container with the whole stack set up and available, and that's on Docker Hub. This container has been built for use either as a single user Jupyter instance or in a multi-user environment in conjunction with Jupyter Hub and Docker Spawner. Finally, I want to reiterate that all of this is open source. We have several GitHub repositories that are publicly available, and anyone is welcome to check them out. Uh, we love pull requests, I mean, who doesn't? Documentation is available right in GitHub and linked from each repository's readme. So 
to close, I want to take a look at the larger Jupiter ecosystem and where things are going. Uh, Jupiter has some great tools and a lot of pretty cool integrations. In particular, uh, we know that real-time collaboration is in the works, and we're keeping an eye on that as it progresses. We've also been exploring the new Jupyter Lab front-end stack, and Jupyter Lab compatibility is coming in the near future. Finally, we've been investigating Jupyter's new bundler API and how that might allow us to encapsulate a notebook's dependencies so that can be made portable and transferred along with the notebook itself. We're committed to making sure that gene pattern notebook plays well with others and contributes to the greater Jupyter community. So before we move on to the Q&A, let me just give a few acknowledgments to people who have contributed to gene pattern and the gene pattern notebook. Uh, you can see our team over there on the left, uh, Jill Mezarov is our PI. And on the right, uh, you can see that we've gotten funding from these wonderful organizations. I would also like to put up a few resources from the net, uh, which you can visit if you want more information. These include the notebook repository, our website, our GitHub instance, Docker Hub, et cetera. And finally, I want to thank everyone for attending the talk. So with that being said, I am happy to take questions. Yes. I have a couple of questions. <clears throat> so the, uh, excuse my ignorance, I'm not very familiar with iPy widgets. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about how uh, MD tooling is different than iPy widgets? So iPy widgets uh, gives you a, a number of like basic tools to work with. For example, you can create buttons or drop downs or sliders. And it uh, uses this library called Traitlets to send the information uh, you, you see in your browser to the Python kernel. Uh, and that will update your, you know, basically the state of your kernel there. And we, we use those, those widgets as building blocks in, uh, in our MB tools package. Um, and uh, essentially what we're doing is we're taking those building blocks and we're allowing the, basically, uh, and we're putting them together in a way that is uh, uh, basically automatically generated from uh, your code. Um, uh, Can't you I thought you could also decorate your bits with I find widget uh, code that would also auto generate for. Uh, there, there is some capability for that now in, uh, in IPy widgets, but it's, uh, it's, it's very bare bones, and you have to do a lot of the, the styling yourself as in some of the other hookups. And the, the second question is, uh, this may be obvious, but uh, once you, uh, in the example that you showed, the, uh, the analysis that you showed, uh, once you send the data, it gets analyzed, and I think I understood that it's on some remote server when the analysis happens. It comes back, and you can you can browse that data, and you can explain what the data frame, you can inspect that data frame, or do you just get like the raw result? So the the particular example I showed you, and let me just uh, switch back to Chrome here. Um, the analysis in this step right here is in fact being done uh, with a remote service on a compute cluster. It doesn't have to be. Uh, these other sort of steps are being done locally. Um, uh, and it's just a matter of your preference. I just wanted to demonstrate both calling remote services and local code execution uh, in the same pipeline. The question is, can you inspect the, like, uh, presumably this comes back to some sort of yeah. data frame or something, and you can get a whole view. So in the case of this particular service we're calling, uh, you actually get uh, files written the disk back, and uh, you can load those uh, into a data frame. Uh, but the actual returned objects are basically these URLs that you can retrieve the, the result files. Um, there, are other, or there are other services out there that you can, be call, you can call that will return things in different formats. Um, but that's, that's what's happening behind the scenes in this particular case. If you're not able to inspect the data, then I struggle to see the value of this against like what I need in app application. Like the interactive experience to the researcher to like inspect the data, but all you're doing is like exposing the UI. I'm not sure if that's what you're doing or not. Without getting the, the data back for you to flexibly investigate it, uh, I'm not like I'm struggling yeah. to see the, what the differentiation is. Um, I, I apologize. I'm not sure I'm really understanding the question, um, but uh, we, can, we can move on. I can talk to you about that. Sure. 
So um, by default, it basically produces uh, this, uh, which uh, on the back end is using the IPy widgets framework. And uh, yeah, it produces an IPy widget that uh, embeds it in the notebook right there. And then it also encapsulates it in, uh, oh, here are the local ones to this notebook. Uh, and you can just, uh, basically encapsulates this with a bit of JSON metadata. And uh, you can, uh, you automatically get the ones that are available in your notebook, but you can also kind of package these up as a library of interactive analyses and then load them into other notebooks. So, um, I mean, it really, the, the, so the short answer is it depends. Um, uh, if you're installing it locally, then you're just, you know, you're, you're running things locally. Um, uh, you, can, you can, for example, start up, uh, start up an instance of uh, Jupyter and install these extensions on basically any Jupyter server. So if you have access to like a compute cluster, you can just uh, install it and run it there and uh, you can do that. Our, uh, our individual, um, uh, uh, our, our hosted notebook repository is, uh, uh, well, we actually do the computed number of places, but the head node is running on AWS. And uh, we also have uh, some computation that's running at uh, TAC and uh, at Indiana University's compute cluster and a few other places. Any other questions? Going once? Going twice. Um, so far, uh, the response has been pretty positive. Um, uh, we have a number of people that are uh, currently looking at uh, doing integrations, and we're excited about that. And uh, we're reaching the point where uh, a number of the notebooks that have been, de been developed using this tool are reaching, are reaching public, beginning to reach that publication point, and we're excited to uh, see that get out there and uh, used more. And these are, at their heart, just Jupyter extensions, so. Yeah. Is it possible to potentially create one of these widgets where you can see the output stream and the value rather than having to transfer? Yeah, it's possible to, uh, to create widgets that do that. Um, we tend to, at least for our internal offerings, we tend to follow a pretty, uh, th we tend to follow that you hit run pattern. Um, because we're just trying to be consistent in that way, but it, it's not, that's not mandated. <laughs>